how did you get interested enough in Bob Ryan to do this? And did you, you know, in my writing, I always like to try to find, I, to find the person to, to, to have that. Do you feel that you found Robert Ryan and what motivated you to write a book about him? Well, let's see. Uh, in terms of what motivated me to write about him, um, I was aware of him at a very early age because I, I went to uh, Loyola Academy, uh, which is a Jesuit uh, high school in, um, in Chicago, in the Chicago area, and uh, he had been an alumnus of that school. He had gone to that school uh, back in the 20s when it was um, in Chicago near the Loyola campus. Uh, so I was aware of him, uh, you know, since I was a high school student. And um, I think what, what really interested me most about him personally was uh, as uh, I, first of all, before the book uh, was written, I wrote this story for the Chicago Reader, which is this uh, alternative weekly in Chicago where I work. And um, the impetus for the story was this letter that uh, came into our possession that Ryan had written for his children, talking all about his uh, childhood in Chicago and growing up there, and, uh, and, and had then filed away and forgotten, and they didn't even read this thing until after he had died. They found this document. And uh, so I wound up writing a, a cover story for the reader about, about this letter that had been uncovered, and, and the project sort of uh, progressed from there. And I certainly found, uh, I, I knew pretty soon into it that the real challenge was gonna be getting this guy on the page, because he was a very reclusive person. Um, he was a very private person. He didn't want people to know about his private life. He said once an actor's life should be, private life should be completely private, that people shouldn't know anything except what they see on screen. Anything they know about me is gonna distract from what I'm doing. And so, uh, and he and his wife did not uh, like the Hollywood lifestyle. They didn't go to Hollywood parties and hobnob with people. His, his wife just couldn't stand that. And uh, so, and they lived a very, uh, Kind of reclusive, secluded life. They lived, uh, you know, in North Hollywood instead of, you know, being in the in the film community. They, they lived out in San Fernando Valley, and so I knew writing it that the biggest challenge was going to be getting him on the page because he was so. Uh, uh, I mean, even his children said he was uh, just really hard to read, really hard to figure out. Played his cards close to the chest, and I found that when I interviewed people that knew him, I always got the same response, which was a uh, love guy, great, great, great guy, I really liked him. Didn't know anything about him, but uh, <laughs> uh, just like people seem to really have a very high regard for him, but nobody seemed to know him well. So I knew that was gonna be the yeah. toughest part. Well, how, whether it succeeds or not, I'll leave for the readers to decide, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did he, he was black Irish, to use that term, and uh, you know, uh, you know, we're certainly not making him out to be a saint. He did have his his dark moods, and he did drink. Uh, what was what was kind of churning in him the darker side of, of Bob Ryan? Well, he had uh, uh, the family had a serious trauma when he was a young boy. When he was about eight years old, he was he was the eldest child, the elder child. He had a younger brother named John who died of influenza at the age of six, and apparently that was very hard on him, very hard on the family. Mm -hmm. Um, so he carried that around with him for a long time. Um, you know, when I asked his son Cheney about his depressions, because he did suffer from chronic depressions, uh, his son told me, you know, he, my father didn't get depressed about his life. When he got depressed, it was usually about Richard Nixon or something like that. I mean, <laughs> you know, just, you know, the things that like made him, uh, the things that bothered him was just the things the that were happening in the world, you know, yeah. and, and the world situation. I mean, he really felt deeply about that. and. Um, and he would become very frustrated by the way the country was going, certainly in the 50s. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, his, in his mind, what were his greatest performances? And in your mind, what were his greatest performances? Did they overlap? Or? Well, this one, certainly, I would, I would name. Yeah. Um, I know that the ones that he always named were um, The Setup. He really liked that movie. It was Great a, movie. a boxing picture by Robert Wise. He was very proud of that one. Um, he liked, uh, there's a movie called Inferno, which is almost impossible to see. It was a 3D movie uh, mm -hmm. made in 1953 during the first wave of uh, 3D. Uh, it was made by 20th, 20th Century Fox. And um, actually they just put out a Blu-ray of it. Uh, but for years and years it's been mm -hmm. impossible to see because obviously it's hard to see things in 3D. I, I, have, to, I have a confession to yeah. make on Inferno. I did a 
90-minute commentary with Lisa Ryan for Inferno really? that somewhere in a filing cabinet at 20th Century Fox it remains. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the uh, overseas they've released the 3D version, which is good. Right. Which is good. Great movie. Well, he uh, so he was proud of that one, um, and he uh, was proud of the Naked Spur with Jimmy Stewart, where he plays uh, the villain in that movie. Yeah. Um, he was really proud of his performance on that. Mm -hmm. Um, he was very happy about uh, Billy Budd, a movie he made in 1962 where he played Mr. Claggart, uh, this adaptation of Melville. He had just loved, loved Herman Melville, and one of the big frustrations of his life was that he didn't get to play Captain Ahab. And he always hated Gregory Peck because Peck got to play Captain Ahab, and he didn't. <laughs> Um, and uh, so he was proud of Billy Budd. That's another terrific performance. I'd certainly yeah. rank that, you know, in his top five or six performances. Um, he was really happy with The Iceman Cometh, which he made right at the end of his life. It was this four-hour film that John Frankenheimer did of The Iceman Cometh, where he played. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone in our audience has seen that, but it. I think it was either made for TV, a movie like movie made for TV, it PBS. Actually, it type was of movie. actually there was this series at the time called the American Film Theater. Yes. It was one of these things where you would buy you would buy tickets by subscription. I think through American Express you could buy tickets, and then they would show it like one night. It was kind of like these things they do now, where they have like opera uh, performances in movie theaters. It was similar to that, and so you would buy the ticket ahead of time and then see this movie um, you know on Monday night or whenever they whenever they screened it and uh, that was a necessity in the case of that movie since it's four hours long <laughs> yeah well that that movie is really incredible because not only was it uh, Robert Ryan's last movie but it was also Frederick March's last movie so you have Frederick March Robert Ryan and you have Lee Marvin playing Hickey I mean it, it does not get any better than that and, and Jeff Tremendous. Bridges as well and Jeff and yeah, young Jeff Bridges in fact uh, one of Jeff Bridges' comments was they were getting ready to do a take, and Ryan was sitting there, and by this time, I think he was seriously ill, and he always had that, that haggard appearance, and particularly in that, because you know, uh, because of the, uh, the period piece. And he sees Ryan's getting ready, and he's going like that, and he noticed that Ryan's hands were getting that nervous Bob Sweat, and Jeff Bridges says, do you still get that? And he said something like, kid, when when that stops happening, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. <laughs> you know, of course yeah, so, I do. Yeah, I asked him, are you still scared at this point? He said, yeah. if I weren't scared, I'd be really scared. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. There but, you know, the go. thing I've, uh, that's that's a, a great story. And, and the interesting thing is that Ryan once said, uh, uh, I found this old interview he had, did, he had done where he said that nothing threw him like having to play a scene seated at a table, which this was. And he was a very physical actor. And uh, he, he tended to express characters... Uh, you know, through movement, he, he was one of those actors that believed that uh, people say all sorts of things, but what they what they do is what really defines them. And so he always tried to define his characters through the way they moved and what they actually did. And so uh, for him to do a scene seated as, at a table was uh, a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> also, it was one of these scenes where uh, this was a John Frankenheimer uh, movie, and it's one of these scenes where they had two cameras shooting them and like zooming in and out at different times. And these scenes went on for like nine or ten minutes. Uh, just an uninterrupted take of nine or nine or ten minutes. So they had to, you know, actually play this thing like they were playing it on stage, mm -hmm. and also deal with these cameras and everything else. So it was a very complicated thing to shoot, and uh, mm -hmm. so I'd probably be sweating too. <laughs> yeah.